First, let me congratulate you on this incredible accomplishment and on the journey of success that starts right now. My topic today is success. One of the wonderful things about being a business school professor at ESA or at Harvard, where I teach most of the time, is that I get to meet some of the most successful people in the world. And what I love to do is to ask them to tell me their stories of success. Because human life is about stories. And I remember I was talking five years ago to a friend of mine, one of the, literally one of the wealthiest men in the world. And I said, you never told me the story of your success. Tell me the story. He said, you want to hear my story of success? I'll tell you my story. I started when I was 14 years old. I lived in a little town in Kansas. And one day I was at the edge of town and there was an apple orchard. I was looking it up at the apples outside the fence and the farmer, he came up to me and he said, hey kid, you want an apple? I said, yeah. He said, that'll be five cents. <laughs> and I had a nickel, I had five cents. So I gave him the five cents, he gave me the apple and I was walking back into town shining it on my shirt and a businessman came up to me and he said, that's a good looking apple. I'll give you 10 cents for it. And I said, that's 100% profit. And my business was born. Every day I went and got an apple, brought it back into town. Pretty soon I brought boxes of apples. I got my driver's license and I was bringing truckloads of apples every day, truckload after truckload, doubling my money, 100% profit. This went on after day after day, year after year. And then my father died and left me $100 million. <laughs> and that's my story of success. <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself when he told me that story, I need better stories. So I started looking for the true stories of success that I think could inspire people who deserve inspiration. People like you and us and me and every person on the planet. What is the success we should really learn? What are the lessons we really should learn? So I started looking in the places where you wouldn't ordinarily look. I looked at the stories of success of immigrants and refugees and poor people and people with disabilities. But you know where I found the best stories of success? In the place where you'd expect it the least. The people that we never think will be successful. The people that we throw away. I'm talking about convicted criminals. I found people who had been in prison that gave me the greatest stories of success I'd ever heard. There was a place that I visited in Texas, in Houston, called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program, for example, where I found inmates, people in prison, in their last year of prison, that are being given the chance to begin a startup business. Business people, entrepreneurs, people like you, would go into these prisons in the last year and give them business planning advice and how to, how to actually write a business plan, how to put together a budget. And they would conceive of these businesses that for the very first time would use their creativity in a truly constructive way. Now I followed some of these people and they did incredibly well with their lives. And, I, and one day I was talking to the people who ran this program and I asked a very simple question. I said, what percentage of these men actually start their businesses? They were so successful. They, and give you an idea of how successful they are. In, in my country, in the United States, many of you are Americans too, if you've been in prison, the chances are 70% you will be back in prison within two years of your release. These men, 7%. 7%, one-tenth. What's the secret of success? They started their businesses, right? I said, how many, what percentage start their businesses? The answer, 16% start their businesses. It doesn't make sense. How is that possible? He said, oh no, you don't understand. Business planning, enterprise planning, is not about startup businesses. It's about startup lives. What these men learn is that their enterprise is their life. And so when they get out of prison, what do they do? They use the initiative, they use the energy, they use their ideas and creativity, how? To reconnect with their families, to marry the women who are the mothers of their children, to take care of their children, to build their faith, to get jobs, to work in their communities, which is truly an entrepreneurial thing. That's why that program 
is so incredibly successful. That inspired me a lot. And so I started asking these men for advice, sincere advice, advice for my life. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the two biggest pieces of advice. And this is the first graduation ceremony probably ever of a great and elite business school where the graduation advice for the graduates is going to come from prisoners. But here it is. Do you want to be successful in life? Counsel number one, take more risk. You know, it's funny. It sounds crazy to, to get the advice to take a lot of risk from criminals because, you know, criminals, <laughs> they take too much risk. I was talking to one man who had spent 10 years in prison for robbing liquor stores. And I said, well, how did you get caught? I mean, it's kind of an indiscreet question. How did you get caught? And he said, I robbed a liquor store that was downstairs from my house. <laughs> and I said, that's too much risk. <laughs> but that's not the kind of risk I was talking about, that he was talking about, that they were talking about. See, they would risk their safety and they would risk their freedom all the time. But what they told me over and over again is that they were unwilling to take the kind of risk in life that really matters. You know what the risk that really matters is in his life and their life and your life too? It's with your heart. See, most of these men have been raised in families with very little love. Some of them had suffered abuse. The result was that they were tough guys. But under that toughness, they were actually hiding a lot of rejection, a lot of fear. And that fear resulted in an unwillingness for them to give their hearts to other people. This is why when they had kids, they didn't take care of them. This is why they didn't marry the mothers of their children. This is the reason they didn't have good relationships with their families or in their communities, because they weren't willing to take the risk of giving their hearts away, and they feared rejection. But when they did, because of this program, then they were finally able to succeed in life. Now, let me tell you about a social science experiment that really makes this case. See, I'm a social scientist, and my specialty is human happiness. So what I write about is happiness, and I'm looking at experiments all day long that make the point. One of my favorites is the following from the economist Stephen Levitt at the University of Chicago. He wanted to know how people make big decisions in their lives, the hardest decisions in their lives. Now, all of us have had agonizing decisions where you don't know what to do. What school should I go to? What job should I take? Should I ask somebody to marry me? These types of decisions are huge decisions sometimes. The hardest ones are the ones where you don't know, yes or no. You don't know, yes or no. And so you wait, and, and it's painful. You know this feeling. A third of you, according to the data, have a really big decision that's giving you a lot of pain and fear right now. And you know how it feels. So Stephen Levitt had this idea for an experiment. He put out a survey asking, do you have a terrible decision you can't make, yes or no, where yes is a big risk and no is not? I'll make it for you with the flip of a coin if you'll join my experiment. 25,000 Americans signed up for his experiment. America's a great country. We will actually let an economist decide whether or not we're going to marry somebody with the flip of a coin. That is insane. But be that as it may, the results were incredible. Because what happened was that 50%, this is like a drug test, 50% were yes and 50% were no. And then he followed up a year later to see who was happier. The yeses, the big risks, or the no, the safe choices. The, the yeses were 25% happier than the noes. Now, this was an experiment. This was like a drug test. This, my friends, is news that you can use. What this tells us is that we say no too much. You have something scary in your life? You need to say yes to it. And I want to give you a specific example and a specific assignment. I know you're trained in entrepreneurship. I know that many of you are ready and willing to risk millions of euros to start a business. I know you're willing to do that. You know how to do it. You're experts. That's why you came to ESA, the finest business school in Europe. Too many young people today, however, are unwilling to risk their hearts on love. I know this because I have the data. I know this because I'm a professor at another business school. It's true. People are unwilling to commit 
to the idea of giving their hearts romantically to others or to the families who need them. They're unwilling to commit to the idea that family is going to last you for the rest of your life. Too many have relationships with their parents or with their siblings. They're kind of cold and kind of distant. That might be you. Okay, so are you an entrepreneur or are you not? Business is a minor part of entrepreneurship. You want to be a real entrepreneur? You need to take a risk with your heart. Now, I gave this advice one time in a speech, actually relatively recently in Washington, D.C., to a group of people in their 20s, like you. And I thought it was kind of good advice, sort of interesting. A couple weeks later, a man, a young man, a man your age, found me on an airplane. He said, are you Dr. Brooks? I said, yeah. He said, I heard you give that speech about being a real entrepreneur with my heart, <laughs> of telling somebody I love them with risk. He said, so I'm going to do it. I'm on the plane right now to going to Philadelphia. There's a woman I've been in love with for two years, and I never told her. I'm going to tell her because of you. And I said... It was only a speech. <clears throat> and I said a little prayer for him, actually. And then I saw him a month later. I saw him at a party a month later. And I said, how did it go with that woman you were in love with? And he said, she rejected me. She shot me down. It was horrible. And I said, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to give you bad advice. I felt terrible. And he said, no, 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 no. I've been meaning to call you to thank you. I said, thank me? Why? He said, because that was the thing I was most afraid of in my life and it happened, and I didn't die. I'm never going to be afraid of that again. <laughs> so here's the point. You need to take a risk with your heart. And so here's your assignment, my young friends. You have two weeks to tell somebody that you love them, and it's got to be scary. It doesn't have to be romantic. It might be somebody you truly admire, but it might be your family, by the way. You might be from the kind of family that never says these sentimental things. And it might be scary. And if it's not scary, it's not entrepreneurial enough. If it goes well, you will thrive. If it goes poorly, you will survive. But no matter what, once you do this, you will have conquered your fear and you will never be the same. Advice number two from the prisoners. Use your weaknesses more than your strengths. Now, it's funny, you know, when I spend time with, the, with these inmates in Texas, I find something very strange. You know, most of us go around in life, we emphasize our weaknesses. We want everybody to think that we're smart and that we're strong and that we're well-educated. That's what we want. And we de-emphasize our weaknesses. We never talk about our weaknesses. That's crazy to let people in on your weaknesses. But these guys in Texas, they were talking about their weaknesses all the time. They were talking about their former crimes and the mistakes that they had made and the things that they regretted. And it was weird. I noticed that people loved them. People connected to them. People gave them opportunities. Why did they connect to them? Not because of their strengths. Because of their weaknesses. And this is a truth. You shouldn't hide your strengths. Your strengths are the source of the admiration that people have for you and why they want to follow you. But you must not hide your weaknesses because you must have people who want to connect with you. Only with human connection Will you be truly successful? Now, when I was working with the men in Texas, you know, they would tell me these stories over and over again. I'd say, oh, wow, you know, it's, a, it's so interesting that you're so open with your strength, with your weaknesses, so open with your problems. And people would say, yeah, no secrets, no secrets. I'm not going to hide anything ever again. But then what? <laughs> I had a very uncomfortable conversation one time because one of them said, don't you have some weakness that you've been hiding? Didn't you ever have a weakness that when you finally told somebody it changed your life? And I was kind of taken aback, right? Because, you know, I'm supposed to be the teacher. And this inmate was asking me, and I said, but then I thought about it, and I have weaknesses too. Big weaknesses as an academic. And I want to tell you about one that changed my life. See, I always wanted to be you. That's what I wanted, but I'm not. I wasn't. When I was 19, I dropped out of college. You know, dropped out, kicked out, ugh, splitting hairs. And I did, I mean, I, I had to make a living. I didn't come from a family that had any money at all. So I did the only thing I knew how to do, which is I played the French horn. 
I went on the road as a French horn player. I didn't make any money. I barely made the rent. It was pretty fun. And along the way, I was on tour in France, giving concerts in France. And I, I met this girl that I fell in love with in just a week's time. And she wasn't from France. It turns out she was from Barcelona. And so I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can make this work. So I quit my job in New York, and I moved to Barcelona. And I took a job playing in the orchestra in Barcelona. Now, by this time, I was in my late 20s. And it was occurring to me that I was growing up. And it was going to be important for me not to make no money for the rest of my life. So I thought, I need to, I need to get more education. But it's hard to go to college when you're a 28-year-old French horn player who got kicked out of college and now lives in Spain. It's hard to get a good education. And by the way, I barely got through high school because I'm a bad student. So I did the only thing that I could do. I signed up at a correspondence school in New Jersey. Distance learning. You've never heard of it. Trust me. <laughs> but I still had this ambition to be you. So I graduated with my correspondence school degree one month before my 30th birthday. This was not a distinguished academic background. But I thought, I'm going to save this. I'm going to make it better. So you know what I did? I applied to the Harvard Business School. And I was ambitious. And I had an idea of how I was going to be strong and good, how I was going to be like you. And I got rejected in one week. <laughs> so I did the following. I decided I was going to call them up and see how close I came. Now, that's stupid. You should never do that, right? Because I was going to put somebody like Chavela in a very awkward position. But I did that anyway. I called up the, the admissions person at the Harvard Business School, and I said, I just got rejected from your program. And they said, I'm sorry. He said, no, no, it's fine. But how close did I come? And, and it, this was before everything was online. So I heard her put down the phone and opening a file cabinet and papers. And she comes back to the phone in two minutes, and she says, um, not close. <laughs> It was horrible. Now, I, I applied to some other programs, and, and, and finally there was a, a university that wasn't paying attention, and they accepted me. And, and, you know, things went this way. But you know what? I never told anybody about this, because many of you know the situation in the United States. Prestige comes from the quality of your school. You will always be proud to have a degree from ESA. Trust me. It's well known all over the world. And my students at Harvard are very proud of their degrees, too, and they should be. But when you didn't, it's embarrassing. So I never told anybody. I went into academia. I became a professor. I never really told anybody about my academic past. I finally took a job as a CEO. I was running a think tank, a, 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 a center of investigation, of research in Washington, DC. All of my employees went to Harvard and Stanford and ESA and Berkeley and Oxford, all of them, the best universities in the world. It was incredible, right? And they didn't know that I had nothing. And I was the boss. Until one day, I had a researcher who worked for me, one of my professors. His specialty was higher education, the economics of universities. And he was doing a research project on small correspondence schools, kind of close to home. He called me up in the middle of the night one night, and he said, boss, I just saw on the website for a correspondence school in New Jersey that they're saying that you're a graduate. This is obviously a mistake, so you have to get this corrected. I was in trouble. I was caught by my own employee. So you know what I did? I decided, you know, this has gone too far. I decided to write about it for the New York Times. I wrote an article called My Cheap, Valuable College Degree. <laughs> and what I talked about was that, you know, had it not been for that place, I would have no degree. I would have no opportunity. I would have no way to improve my life and how grateful I was for that opportunity. And then I said, uh, I'm going to get a lot of people mocking me and people making fun of me. I know. But you know what? It didn't happen. No, it didn't happen. On the contrary, I got hundreds of messages from people who said that it inspired them. And for people who could relate to me for the very first time. And people who felt that that was a connection with them. That weakness was my strength. Had it not been for that, I wouldn't be here with you. I wouldn't get to do these things. And had I not shared that, I would not have connected. Now, let me tell you one little ending of that little story. After I wrote that article in the New York Times, the president of that little college called me 
and he asked me to be their graduation speaker. What's the graduation at a correspondence school? I don't know. I mean, is it just 10 people around a table? I don't, I don't know. But I went, and it was 5,000 people in an arena. And all of them had come from families where nobody went to college. Most of them were poor, and they were all looking for opportunities. <laughs> and it was amazing for me, because I gave my graduation speech, and then I sat down, and we were giving out diplomas, just like, like Dean Hoykamp and I just did. And this lady, she's about 45 years old, African-American lady. And she gets up, and they get to say, there's so many of them, there's a thousand people graduating. There's so many of them, they get to say their name and one thing, and that's it, they have to get off the stage, like, done. And she says this, she says her name, and she said, and for this moment, <laughs> I want to thank my five children and the son of the living God. <laughs> and I said, these are my people. These are the people that I want to be. That is success. And I was proud that day. Now, if I look out at you, I see strengths on full display. But what about your weaknesses? You all have them. Your assignment. I know the first one was hard. This one's harder. Make a list and then plan on how you can share these in a humble, easygoing way over the course of your career. That will be the source of your strength. You're graduating today from a truly great business school. You're heading out to fight the battles of life, and you're going to win. You can be successful. You want to be successful. You will be successful. But what you really crave, I know what you crave, because you're just like me. As a person, you want to be successful in the enterprise, the startup of your life. You want to create value with your life. You want to be happy. You want to love others, you want to be loved, and you want to serve your sisters and brothers. That's what you want. That requires that you live your life like a startup. There is no other way. And that means taking risk with your heart and sharing your full self, including your weaknesses. That is your first set of assignments as a formal graduate of this great program. By the way, you want to know how that escapade in Barcelona turns out, where I ran to Barcelona and took a job? We got married 30 years ago. My kids are grown up. My daughter is going to the University of Navarre. That is my most impressive and important enterprise. And it has nothing to do with my education, and it has nothing to do with my career. I wish you great success in the matters of your life. Congratulations on your achievement today and all the happiness that you deserve and you will earn in the future. God bless you, and thank you.